If you would like a free newsletter on this or other subjects, just give us a call at Christian Answers. The phone number is area code 512-218-8022. That's 512-218-8022. Or you could email us at cdebater at aol.com. That's cdebater at aol.com. Thank you. Hello, this is Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers of Austin, Texas, Christian Debater. Please check out our YouTube channel page, C Answers TV. That's C A N S W E R S T V. Just type it into the YouTube search box, then click on one of our links for it. Our channel page features 19 playlists on all types of subjects, such as Jehovah's Witnesses with 17 videos. And by the way, these are videos we've produced ourselves. Mormonism, 14 videos. Seventh-day Adventism, 11 videos. Phony TV Preachers and King James Onlyites, 14 videos. Nation of Islam, Black Muslims, this is of the Louis Farrakhan type, 20 videos. God-hating atheists, agnostics, and know-it-alls, 18 videos. Darwin's Metaphysical Evolution Religion, 17 videos. UFOs, Ghosts, Magic, Spiritual Warfare, 16 videos. Islam, such as Sunni Muslims, Shiite Muslims, Alawites, Sufis, 54 videos. Roman Catholicism, Idolatry, and the Virgin Mary, 71 videos. Anti-Trinitarians, such as the United Pentecostal Church and Church History, 36 videos. Antichrist cults, the New Age and World Religions, 38 videos. Saved by Works, Baptism, Church of Christ, Campbellism, 69 videos. Hell, Lake of Fire, Unpopular Bible Doctrines, 19 videos. Predestination, Arminianism, and Calvinism, 54 videos. End Times, Supernatural Prophecies and Tough Bible Questions, 20 videos, and others. and welcome once again to our program. I'm Larry Wessels, Director of Christian Answers, and I want to thank you for being with us today. I'm joined in studio today with our Director of Research, Steve Morrison. Steve, great to have you here as usual. Well, thank you, Larry. Steve has done a lot of extensive research into early church history, and I'm talking about Christian church history. And uh, we have been doing a continuing series along that line. This is already show number 18 in that series. Uh, we have covered a lot of territory showed uh, the contrast between early ch Christian history and other religions, whether it be Islam, whether it be cultic groups such as uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormonism, uh, other world religions like uh, what we now know as Roman Catholicism. Uh, and we've touched on a lot of other groups and how they contrast with early church history. We've also shown the, the similarities of early church history with uh, the Bible, which is basically where they're coming from on the essentials, and we're showing how that relates up to us here in the 21st century. Now, church history is just another uh, uh, proof, you might say, for the validity of the Word of God. A lot of people would dispute that, but that's one reason we did this series, to show what early church history actually says in contrast to these people who are making these dis uh, disputations. Now, uh, we were talking last time about how uh, there was evangelistic practices church, uh, used by the early church uh, the writers and evangelists at that time and how they actually uh, went into debates against uh, Gnostic heretics, people with other philosophies, other religious ideas, 
uh, pseudo-Christian ideas and, and religious philosophies that uh, actually attacked the basis of the Christian faith. And uh, these early church writers fought against them theologically, not with the sword, but in, in this case, as Steve has done the research, with a pen, mm -hmm. writing. And uh, we find that uh, today, as we do our evangelistic efforts, uh, we should follow the same patterns as these early uh, Christian writers did in the sense that they're doing what they're doing basically because we find a basis for it in the Word of God, the mm -hmm. Old Testament and the New Testament. And uh, with that established and set up, uh, let's pick up where we left off from last time, Steve, uh, talking about uh, their, you know, their battles, I guess, with heresy, Gnostics, things of that nature, which tied in with their evangelism methods. Mm -hmm. And we were about to get into some of the examples from the early church writers uh, that relate to this. So go ahead. Okay. We talked about how, how they battled counterfeits that would claim to follow Christ but wouldn't. And this next example is kind of an instructive. Uh, Irenaeus, who wrote 182 to 188 AD, and he cataloged all the heresies and other religions that he knew of at the time, he discusses Serto and his successor, Marcion. And he also discusses Valentinus and Simon the Saucer and Simon's disciple Menander. This is in Irenaeus Against History, Book 3, Chapter against 4. Against Heresies? Irenaeus Against Heresies, Book 3, Chapter 4, page 417. He is one of many writers who says that Simon the Saucer was actually fairly uh, instrumental in establishing a heresy, and then after him, Menander, and then afterwards things came from that. Uh, many people teach that Gnosticism really started about 170 AD, or actually that or slightly later, with Marcion. And on one hand, that's sort of true, but it's not completely true. The full-blown Gnosticism, we would say, would, would have started then. But Marcion was actually a successor to Serto. And so prior to Marcion's time, you had heretics who would teach that Jesus only appeared to come in the flesh and the teaching need to have the secret knowledge and it's known by knowledge. Now, Gnostics, kind of one definition of Gnostics is that they are against the God of the Old Testament. They say, some say he was an evil, malicious God who made the material world. Others don't. They say he was a foolish God who made a big mistake when he made the material world. But either way, they're against the God of the Old Testament. Uh, prior to Marcion, we don't know that they were necessarily against the God of the Old Testament, so that doesn't really make them Gnostics. But other aspects of Gnostic teaching were prior to that. And uh, that's significant when you read the book of 1 John. 1 John is a very um, positive, uh, a, a good book about a relationship with God on one hand. But on the other hand, you, many people, you can read it and you can see this looks like almost a point-by-point uh, point uh, rebuttal of a lot of Gnosticism. And people have wondered, well, how could 1 John be written that way if the Gnostics weren't until 170 A.D.? And the answer is it really wasn't against the Gnostics that 1 John wrote cause they're, in 1 John because there were, were Gnostics then, but it was against the proto-Gnostics who had some of the aspects of Gnosticism but not all of them. Another example of how the early church viewed all these other groups is in Justin Martyr, who wrote a little bit earlier than Irenaeus, in 138 to 165 AD. And he wrote, With whom we have nothing in common, since we know them to be atheists, and pious, unrighteous, and sinful, and confessors of Jesus in name only, instead of worshipers of him. Yet they style themselves Christians, just certain among the Gentiles inscribe the name of God upon the works of their own hands, and partake in nefarious and impious rites. A nefarious means like evil or secretly evil, by the way, and impious means ungodly. Uh, some are called Marcians, as in from Marcion, and some Valentinians, some Basilidians, and some Saturnians, and others by other names. This is in dialogue with Trifle the Jew. Okay, so Marcion, though he was earlier, actually I think he was like, you know, maybe 140 or so, it really got spread, became more popular after in Justin's time, but, but even in Justin's time there were uh, Gnostics around and he wrote against them and said, look, they're going to be people that are, are that way. Now, this is really no different uh, than, than Paul wrote when he, when he said there would be many heresies that would come afterwards, or even Jesus said there would be many antichrists, uh, you, you know, before the final antichrist. And this isn't necessarily limited to just the end times, but ever since, you know, Christ um, came and rose from the dead, you know, there, Satan has, has sent, um, you know, imposters and, and heretics to come say other stuff. And the early church saw it as their job to expose those and say these People call themselves Christians, but they're not, and they have nothing in common with us. And the church today, 
uh, still continues, um, I guess, that tradition uh, and, and, and that task of just exposing people, um, not violent persecution, not anything else, but just informing and showing the world that a lot of things that are claimed to be Christian really have nothing to do with the Jesus of the Bible. Okay. The other examples are with the Encratites, for example. Uh, the Encratites, Gnostics, the Encratite comes from the word meaning self-control. And uh, Irenaeus says they came from Saturnus and Marcion. And the Encratites were against marriage, and some of them were against animal food, i.e. meat. And Tatian, who was a hero of Justin, Justin Martyr was also one who introduced this blasphemy. Tatian was novel in denying the salvation of Adam. In other words, he said that Adam never, never repented and Adam never went to heaven after he sinned. That's what the Encratites said. Or that's what Tatian the Encratites said, rather. This is Irenaeus against heresies. Also, for R6, Tertullian mentions Tatian, a brother heretic. Kind of an uh, unusual, almost uh, uh, oxymoron. He was a disciple of Justin Martyr, but after Justin's death, he had different opinions, and like Valentinus. So he spoke against that too. So even, uh, there aren't many examples of people who were Christians and then joined a, a heresy, but Tatian is kind of the uh, main example that, the, that we can point to that did that. Okay, so we showed how the early Christians uh, disputed against uh, others that claimed to be Christians, but they felt necessary to dispute against any spiritual counterfeit, whether it claimed to be Christian or not. First of all, on one hand, they said don't judge or condemn other people, Eight writers wrote about that, but then they also disputed against Judaism. Seventeen writers, they didn't deny anything about the Old Testament or, or that um, God gave the law for the Jewish people to follow at that time, but they said that the Judaism was wrong because they missed their Messiah. And so seventeen writers wrote about that. They also, at least sixteen writers, wrote against, against Greco-Roman paganism. But there's also another strand of Greek philosophy that was either denied one god or was almost, almost atheistic, and 14 writers wrote additionally against that. And then over in Persia, you had the Zoroastrian religion. And the Zoroastrian religion, they uh, were almost a dualistic religion where there was a, a good god and a more evil god, I guess. And they were familiar with that, and some of them lived in modern-day Iraq and things like that. And so they wrote against that. Eleven writers wrote against that. And they also disputed against two groups that they saw as separate, or at least distinct, but they, you know, may not have seen everything perfectly clearly. The Brahmins, which today would be pretty similar to what we would think of as Brahmins in India, and the Gymnosophists. Now, Gymnosophists sounds like a people who do athletic things. And you think of somebody practicing yoga who could be very flexible or something like that. And even though they didn't live, the, live in India, they were somewhat knowledgeable about them, and they, and they distinguished with the different kinds. They said some of the Brahmins, they abstain from marriage and from all animal meat and things like that, but then they said other Brahmins who lived differently kind of supported the first kind, but they still married and had children and things like that. And the gymnosophists, they said, would uh, uh, go around being holy, being very ascetic, and they go around naked all the time, which they thought kind of primitive, I guess. Uh, they also disputed closer to home against Egyptian myths. In fact, one of them kind of derisively said, well, at least the Greco-Romans, they try to worship, you know, gods that look like human beings. But the Egyptians, they worship gods that look like frogs and cats and uh, crocodiles and any other an an animal you can think of. Uh, and then they also disputed against the, the Chaldean or, uh, and or, well, or Babylonian religion. And the, Chalde and the Babylonian religion had some differences, but it was sort of built upon uh, the, 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 well, you got the Sumerian and there's a transformation with the... Uh, to the Chaldean and Babylonian, but they disputed against that. Uh, a lot of Western astrology actually has its roots, not in Sumerian religion, but in the Babylonian religion, and it kind of came from there. Now, Eastern astrology, kind of more Chinese-based, was a uh, different origin, but a lot of it came from there. And so they disputed not just against the religion and the, and the gods and goddesses, uh, Ishtar and Tammuz and all that, but they also disputed against the magic that the Babylonians claimed to practice, as well as, as well as their astrology, okay? And they also disputed against uh, Arabian and Syrian religions. Now these are kind of lesser known to modern people as well as to historians. You know, we're talking, you know, between 100 and 325 AD, that the Arabian religion, they worshipped a stone. And they didn't say too much about that, but there was a stone, and they also said that the women were completely covered where you couldn't see anything except for one eye. So way back then, long, long before Muhammad, these were the characteristics that, that they saw in that. 
Uh, they also disputed the Druid or other European myths. Six writers talked about this, and basically Greco-Roman gods would not count here, but sometimes they would mention the Druids by name, sometimes they would mention religion of Gaul or of Britain or what they did there, which basically would probably be the Druids, but they didn't mention that by name or other things. So they basically tried to show why Christianity was more reasonable than pretty much every religion that they knew of at, uh, at that time. I'd like to draw attention to the viewers at home once again about your chart here, which is saying dispute against other errors. And your very first point, do not judge, condemn others. And you have the two references there. In fact, I noticed Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 is probably the, once, the most uh, quoted Bible verse that's known by most unbelievers and drunks in the world. <laughs> judge not, lest you also be judged. Okay. Uh, the... the the interesting thing is when you're dealing with a lot of uh, uh, non-Christian religionists or atheists or non-believers of one sort or another is that they, they want to say, you're not loving, you're not, you're not right with God because you're judging. You're, you're judging and you're not supposed to judge because the Bible says, judge not lest you also be judged. Uh, you're condemning and all this kind of thing. But as you just went through that list... It, it sounds like they're disputing these guys, they're disputing those guys, they're disputing uh, right down the line, and basically saying that the truth of this reality that we find ourselves in is that the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only real truth amidst this jungle mm -hmm. of religious ideas which have no bearing in actual truth or in reality that we find ourselves in. Right. Uh, so uh, I find it interesting that... Uh, the, the, the problem we have in today's culture is so many people jump on that point number one about judging and not judging. And you Christians aren't supposed to judge. But if they were to read the rest of Matthew chapter 7, where Jesus just starts out with that verse, and read it in context, and go on through the whole chapter, where he's saying things like, cast not the pearls of the gospel before the swine of unbelief, and things of that nature, he actually tells you to judge you know, you'll know the, the tree by its fruit and all these types of things. Uh, you're to judge, and how do you judge? You judge based on the Word of God, based on the doctrines that God has given us, uh, either by, let's say, if you're in the Old Testament with uh, Exodus chapter 20 or Deuteronomy chapter 4 with the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. uh, we make judgments based on what we know is a command from God. If I see a guy going into a bank with a machine gun, and every, all of a sudden, everybody's putting their hands up. And I, I, I know what you do. You, you say, don't judge. I don't know what's happening. Is that what you do? <laughs> so, 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 you know, if you come home from work and you, you walk into your bedroom and you see your wife in bed with another guy and they don't have any clothes on, uh, surely you wouldn't judge them for committing adultery. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there's things where even a, even a parent will judge their kid when, he, when they know he's doing something wrong. Jimmy, did you steal that cookie out of the cookie jar? No, Mommy. Of course, we know he's lying. But, but the thing is, we are to judge. And even the people that say you can't judge, they judge all the time. Okay. And in fact, they even, the ones that use this argument, usually attack the person that, uh, with a judgment about judging. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Which may, but I, I just wanted to bring that point across because it's a very big point. I've run into it a zillion times in my uh, over two decades of evangelism activities now, from all these people that get all bent out of shape, you're not supposed to be judging, you're not, and then they end up judging me. <laughs> uh, so I guess it's all right for them, but not for me. But, yeah. uh, but the key is it's got to be a righteous judgment based on the divine wisdom and knowledge of God predicated on his word that's been given to us through the power of the Holy Spirit. Right. So, 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 we're, so we're not saying, and the early church isn't saying, that you should uh, ignore or reject uh, the, the first part of Matthew 7 where it says don't judge. And, of course, I, and, and we should, no one's going to say that you should ignore the last part of, Ma of Matthew chapter 7 either about Jesus shows how to judge. But So if we're to do both, and Jesus is saying both in the same chapter, you have to ask, well, what does he mean by each? And uh, in judging, you're not supposed to give a judgment condemning a person saying, boy, that person is never going to have their retrobate. They, 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 they're, they're reprobate, God doesn't value them, I'm better than them. Those are kind of judgments that we are not to have. Okay, But on the other hand, we are supposed to discern 
we can we are supposed to judge we're commanded in many places to discern what's right and wrong what's of god and what's not of god so is a person in a false religion today or in a cult today are they ever going to go to heaven are they ever going to be right with god uh we are not to judge that uh rather our task is wherever they are to try to bring them closer to god um but on the other hand uh we would uh we are, we are supposed to discern and you're missing, and, and the early church did both, and the Bible teaches do both, and we should do both. Exactly. In fact, uh, just, uh, just for quick reference here, we'll get back into our, our subject material on the early church history. Uh, if you go to uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15, it says, But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Uh, and, uh, of course, it goes on in verse 16, For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. So what you're told by the Apostle Paul there in Corinthians and in many other places throughout the Scripture, you're told to judge and make discerning things as in, uh, you know, evaluations of what you're seeing, uh, as Steve was referencing to. You're told to judge, but what? But how? Through the mind of Christ. Mm -hmm. Through, and here's the mind of Christ given to us by the Holy Spirit, which is what the, the body of Christ is built upon, the prophets and the apostles, the Word of God uh, that's uh, testified to us by our, the Holy Spirit that indwells every born-again believer. So we are to judge, and uh, it's a cop-out. In a right way, yeah. Exactly. Well, as I said, if you've got the mind of Christ, mm -hmm. you are going to judge righteously and holy because we serve a righteous and holy God. Mm -hmm. And so his opinions, his judgments are righteous and true. Uh, so based on that, I, I, I couldn't resist getting that in because that is such a, a point that comes up so often, is particularly when I'm doing evangelism. Uh, I get these people that, that think you can't judge about anything, yet they themselves hypocritically will judge all kinds of things. Uh, they just really don't want anybody to tell them, Hey, you can't interfere with my life. I'm gonna be my own God and live the way I want to. You know, that's really what it comes down to. Uh, so they're using this this straw man argument about judging when really it has no bearing on the kind of judgment we're talking about because we're talking about a righteous, discerning judgment predicated on the Word of God. Mm -hmm. Well, anyway, I better not take any much more time so we can get to get on with okay. this church history here. I, I, all right. Well, one interesting historical fact that Bartisan knew. Now, now Bartisan. He lived um, east of most Christians. He actually did not live in the Roman Empire, but in the Persian Empire. And he had some strange views and some stuff, but one thing that he knew about was the practice of sati. He wrote, the Hindus, when they die, are all of them burnt with fire, and many of their wives are burnt along with them alive. The Book of Laws of Diverse Countries, an anti nicene Fathers, Volume 8, page 732. Now, historically, Hinduism isn't really a religion, per se, as an ocean of religions. There's so many things there, but there are three things that kind of united all Hindus. One was a belief in reincarnation, another was the caste system, and another was a practice of sati, according to a Hindu friend, friend of mine. And, of course, the sati was abolished when the British came. The British didn't think sati was very proper. Um, but they knew about this back then and thought that this was a barbaric practice to do that. Uh, again, he made a judgment of the, of the practice, but he didn't condemn the Hindu people. Actually, there were some Christians in India from the very earliest times. I believe that the, the Apostle Thomas went to Persia and probably as far as India, and there were early Christians there. Another quote uh, from Lactanius about uh, Egyptian myths. He said that they believe in a thousand other fictions, so that they who regarded these as objects of worship may be said to be more foolish than the Egyptians, who worship certain monstrous and ridiculous images. The Divine Institutes, Book 1, Chapter 21 and 34. So they made judgments, but they didn't condemn the people themselves. Now, just looking at this early Christian theology roadmap briefly, you can kind of see what all we've passed over. And I guess we kind of have a challenge for when people say that their group's unique or unusual beliefs were practiced by early Christians, our challenge to them is out of the 4,100 to 4,200 pages that the early church had written, show us that they believe what this strange belief that you may have. Other people uh, claim that the Bible or key Christian doctrines were irretrievably lost during the Middle Ages or whenever. And again, our challenge is show us from the early Christian writings how that wasn't there. And if you claim that Christianity was changed and lost key doctrines, then show us where this occurred. 
If you claim the early church didn't preserve the teachings of Jesus, then either God didn't care to preserve his truth or some other group did. And show us the other group. We have lots of writings about many other groups, about the groups and from the groups themselves. And again, show us a group close to what you believe. And if you have no evidence and, and, and your group denies key doctrines that the consensus of early Christians confirm, then stop claiming that your beliefs are those of early Christians. So we spent all this time looking and maybe like a magnifying glass at the early church. But let's turn the lens around now and say if an early Christian were to look at all the churches today, briefly, what would they see and what would they remark on? Uh, kind of put the shoe on the other foot for a second. Well, first of all, they look at some churches and say, why are there so many images of people that are used in worship? Uh, they were not image phobic, but they uh, did not use images in worship, and they wonder why we're doing that. They wouldn't fathom why Christians would be uh, toying with the doctrines of demons. Thirty to 40,000 Christians were martyred because they wouldn't worship any god in addition to Jesus, and yet they'd say, why is it in some liberal churches that they might have other gods or other religions there too besides Christianity? They would understand about some so-called Christians claiming Jesus didn't rise from the dead or didn't die for our sins because they had a lot of heresies back then too, and they'd figure they were just other wicked heresies. They were not only against murder, but they considered killing babies murder, and they wouldn't be able to understand why somebody who committed an abortion would be considered a good Christian. They wouldn't understand why in history the church would have persecuted non-Christians and been violent toward other people when Jesus was the Prince of Peace. Uh, they wouldn't understand why some Christians would watch violent shows or sexually oriented shows when, when they wouldn't do that themselves. They were against stealing, but they might not understand why anybody who claimed to be a Christian would like pirate music or software or other things. And then finally something to think about is we can know so much about the early church because of all the books and writings they have. What if a book were written about you and your beliefs and your practices? Now maybe the world wouldn't consider it interesting enough to publish here, but what if there was a book in heaven about you and what you did and people could read that in heaven? Would that be something that you would be embarrassed for people to read or that you would be glad for people to read? That's something to think about as you live your life and we look back at the early Christians 2000, almost 2,000 years ago, but people may be looking at your life in eternity and what are they going to see? Very well said. Well, we're uh, coming to the end of this 18-part series on early church history, Christian church history. Uh, we hope we've covered a, a lot of the points for you. As I, I think Steve certainly did some great research here. The early church has a lot to say about actual, essential Christian doctrines. And uh, I like his analogy there right here at the end of the show. What if someone wrote a book about you and a history of you? How would that line up with what the Bible teaches? And if it doesn't line up, can you really say you're a Christian? The, the, the bottom line is you need to have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ based on the Word of God, the Old Testament, New Testament, testified to by the early Christian church all the way up through now. The, the facts are all there. You have no excuse. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about your life. Think about someone writing your, that book on you. And, and consider the claims of Jesus Christ, the Lord of life. But we're out of time. Uh, we have to go. If you have any other questions, check out our website, biblequery.org, uh, uh, historycart.com. Email us, whatever you need to do. We'll be glad to try to help you any way we can. Well, I'm Larry Wessels with Steve Morrison for Christian Answers. Thank you for being with us, and may the Lord bless you richly. Check out our websites, biblequery.org, 
This site answers 7,700 Bible questions. Historycart.com. This site reveals early church history and doctrine proving Roman Catholicism is not historically or doctrinally viable. MuslimHope.com. This site is a classic refutation of Islam, a counterfeit religion created by Muhammad. Free newsletters are also available. 